Well, welcome guys to another episode of System 333 on air. Today I have another international guest, Ignis Alonso, yoga instructor, remedial masseur, and also uh, very, uh, very well informed on the way of thinking of today's society. Um, he has a number of wonderful posts on his Facebook, really insightful. You don't get many people these days speaking a lot of sense rather you get a lot of people posting the opinions <laughs> of <laughs> absolute ramblings and nonsense but ignis is a very switched on guy i have him here you're, you're from uh wet west coast us is that right new jersey united states oh, east coast sorry east coast us new jersey in between um in between new york and philly is that right right Welcome to the show, brother. How's everything been going over there on the East Coast? What's been happening during the uh, pandemic, during the coronavirus? I was there three years ago, um, November 2017. I was traveling from New York to Philly. I think I passed New Jersey because it's on the way. Yeah, New Jersey's like, you hear a lot of things going on in New York, and then you hear about a lot of things that happen in Philly, but you don't really ever hear about Jersey. But Jersey during this pandemic, if I'm being honest, it never really felt like there was a lockdown. Uh, I feel like in New Jersey, a lot of the people kind of worked together, if you want to call it that. And so when lockdown began, everybody had their masks on for the most part. And if they didn't have their masks on, people were just staying away from each other. So now we're at a state where everything is kind of back to quote unquote normal. Everybody's just masked. That's the only difference. Um, and now with all of this information coming to light, with there being more avenues of information, with people asking more questions and all of these jarring and outrageous news articles showing up from multiple sources. And the biggest thing that most people have become aware of this year is that there is no one news narrative. There is no one. Uh, this is the truth. There are so many different. This year has proven that more than anything. Right. This year has proven that literally anyone can go onto the Internet create a journalist site and just put whatever they want on there and slap it on Facebook. And someone's going to say, this is real news. This is journalism. <laughs> that, that feeds into the misinformation war that we're kind of in right now, where we don't know what's actually happening. We only have an idea. We only have what we're being fed through newspaper articles, through uh, you know, mainstream media, through whatever journalism we can get our hands on, because Something that we're experiencing over here is that journalism is being silenced. You have journalists being attacked and <laughs> things are just developing in a way where if you're really paying attention, the biggest thing that comes to mind is why are certain people being asked to quiet, to be silent, but then you have this big majority of people whose platforms we have to listen to. And it's like, why is that? Yeah, so I can explain something. Um, this is very interesting. I love coming to this topic, actually, because <laughs> um, this is a topic I discussed many years ago. And part of the reason System 333 actually formed was as an antidote to this whole situation. Long in advance, you can, my videos here somewhere, I have a video on my Facebook where I, um, my, my key line in that video is, what if I gave you a map? What if I gave you a map? for the age of information to explain everything going on and how information is dissected and diverted. And the system 333 framework was a triangular loop in which the st everything that was objective, uh, the subjective objective and human experience. And look, say what you want. People base their beliefs, people base their actions, people base their behavior upon that. And it's really broken down. I mean, when we look at objective, we look at even things such as gene, uh, uh, genes. So, for example, certain people's way, their cognitive brain development, way of thinking have been passed over from their ancestors to heavily ingrained, right? I know that as a Kashmiri, you probably hear what's happening in Kashmir. Kashmiris have a certain mentality, right? Uh, because of what's happened, the level of oppression they've gone through, right? So, the, and, and the news in India, um, especially... Uh, I don't know if you've been following the news in India, Ignis, but it's a lot of stuff going on there. And it's very interesting to look into the insight of the psychology behind the way different groups in India think and, and how they've come to the conclusion of what India should be, what Kashmir should be. So uh, then we've got so objectively certain people's brains, the way they've developed over time to process information for the better, betterment of their survival. That's happened. The other thing is, is the subjective, 
probably the most common one. That's pretty much your religious, your beliefs, your cultures, um, your ideas, your philosophies, which have also been passed over. And now I think the subjective is the one that's probably the easiest to tamper with. You know why? Because of what you said before, information's available everywhere, right? On Instagram, Facebook, whatever, Twitter, TikTok. I don't know what the fuck people even use these days. <laughs> so, uh, and the newspapers, the news, whatever. A lot of people, the, the last um, lady I had on, uh, on the show, um, she said the first thing she did, she was from Phoenix, uh, was remove the TV, get rid of the TV. TV doesn't belong here. Because um, that was a way of getting subjective information into your brain and it, mm-hmm. it, it fucks up your whole psyche. So then we have the human experience, which is pretty much you base a lot of the information of what you believe in on your own experiences, which that is the most unique thing about you as an individual, your own individual human experience. I can guarantee you every single person I've met in my life has had a completely different experience to me. I don't know anybody so. who's lived a hundred percent identical reality to me, maybe in another time zone, but that's where system 333 came from. And there was a feedback loop I put into it. So why do you think now in 2020, the general population, what well, you, would, you would hope to say the general population, the, the, the people are starting to realize that news has been tampered in all multiple different facets of life, uh, whether it means talking about uh, the human condition, talking about uh, events, and this is across all over the world. Why do you think it's come to 2020 that this has happened? Do you think the coronavirus made this happen? Or do you think this was just something that was waiting to implode for a long time? both i feel like we've had so much information repressed and suppressed throughout the years in order to promote a certain homogenous agenda in every individual country that we have for example in the united states back in the 60s when televisions first became a a thing and people were able to afford them or have access to them the television programming available was designed in such a way where you were either with the collective or you weren't And you wouldn't recognize that because you kept being thrown the word freedom at you. So, so long as you cognitively believed that you lived in a free world, it didn't matter what the TV was showing you. This was just America. You were enjoying your life at the time. So the TV would tell you that you have to dress a certain way in order to consider yourself dressed. If you didn't have a hat on, you weren't fully dressed. Uh, You have to throw your jacket over the puddle for the lady. It's, you don't ever consider having her walk around the puddle. Lord have mercy. She has to walk over the puddle with her jacket on. So, you know, nobody really, dis, nobody really thought to question the narrative that was being promoted to them because they lived in a cognitive utopia. And so now with the day of today where people are realizing so many things, a lot of it has to do with the way that we've set up each homogenous society to operate. And then you look back into nature and nature has three distinct modalities that I can look at and tell you that these exist in nature. Solidarity, the animals that have a, solidar- have a solitary existence, they don't really rely too, on too many ecosystems for their survival. You have the ones who rely on community, who need communities to thrive, and we humans do that as well. I mean, you have communist societies. And then you have survival of the fittest. These are the ones that are like the your Darwinian, lions, the pride, Darwinian. your bear, right. You do you have think, do you think, so just quickly, survival of the fittest. So Darwin is said to be the one who to propose this. I believe survival of the fittest may have poten- potentially does exist pre-Darwinian. Um, that level of thinking definitely exists pre-Darwinian. I'm talking more as a philosophy, not as a practical. Like, where do you think the earliest concept of survival of the fittest by philosophy came in before Darwin? Do you think this is something that was just an unspoken truth? Or do you think- I would say that this rose probably within the first civilization once intelligence started to surface and people realized that, hey, if we take all of the resources, hey, if we set up the systems of authority, hey, if we delegate authority, we will exist in the highest order of nature because that's usually what a lot of philosophers consider the highest order of nature. And it is a ecosystem or an entity that can delegate authority. Because at yeah, that point, you now have a system in place that can operate. Yeah, exactly. It's all about that pyramid um, of dominance, right? The dominance hierarchy, which I think, you know, Jordan Peterson speaks about a lot. Um, but also, uh, this pyramid is an existing uh, archetypal symbol of ancient societies as well. As societies as well. Um, for example, the Tower of Babel. So I don't think I've brought this up on the podcast before, but it's come up quite a bit um, over the last couple of months. The Tower of Babel was um, seen to be a 
So the story in itself was basically people uniting to get to the top and have dominion and control over the world, right? That's the um, story behind it in, in the Old Testament in the Bible. But the interesting thing about Babel was a lot of people assume Babel was built like a leaning tower of pizza. When I remember, remember I went to um, archaeological museum in Israel, the tower of Babel was actually more like a ziggurat pyramid structure, right? Hmm. And then that same structure, and this is, you know, whether you would like to believe the story is a true or a myth or not, is um, was basically replicated right across the world. You have ziggurats in China, ziggurats in South America, ziggurats in Egypt, right? That same pyramid structure. And that was representative of what you're saying, this dominance hierarchy or this uh, survival of the fittest, that those at the top of the pyramid would have dominion and control over the rest of the pyramid um, and, and the, the ones at the bottom. And I think um, one of the first pillars of fundamental pillars of society was, well, how do we develop a functional society and that there needs to be a top to bottom chain of command? Um, I think that's the traditional structure we've had since the beginning. Um, obviously, maybe that's changed in some regards, uh, subtly, but what do you think? Do you think this is still something that's in, in play right now? A lot of people believe that there is a top 1%. Um, I mean, when you look at society, when you observe it and you observe all of the systems that are working with each other in order for society to be, taking one cog out of the system, it does so much to every other system involved. So. What I've noticed is that there are different kinds of people that will usually fall into two spectrums. You have people that think linear, linear thinking. You have people who just think vertically. They think about productivity. This is your typical average vanilla human with their own unique experience, just like <laughs> the rest of us, who is just going to be, you know, someone who seeks a career, seeks to establish a business, wants a family, children, you know, the bread and butter. There's nothing wrong with that. That type of existence allows for a society to be built. And then once you're inside of a society, then you have people who think horizontally. These are your artists, your free thinkers, your deep thinkers, your creative people who are now in the luxury of space to do things like look at the moon. Let's say it's a crescent moon and they're like, hey guys, you see that crescent moon? It looks like a croissant. Somebody who's in a vertical state of mind isn't going to put that association together. They're worried about tomorrow. They're worried about making sure that the work is done. The person that thinks horizontally they're not in a state of mind, their environment didn't pr allow for them to be a vertical thinker. And you have a lot of those in society and as society continues to become bigger and bigger and bigger, there's less and less and less work available. So this allows for more deeper exploration of the self. This is where that quote that I had posted the other day where it's like, I'm tasked with the job of self-actualization, meaning and purpose because now the landscape allows for like people like that to explore that. I would say maybe 300 years ago in the United States of America, for example, the landscape it. wasn't as settled and as diverse at the moment to actually allow for horizontal, horizontal thinkers to flourish. But now you have vertical thinkers and now you have your horizontal thinkers and they're pretty much at war with each other because they don't understand each other's purpose in society. They don't understand what each other contributes. If you're a vertical thinker, you probably see art as meaningless. You see entertaining, uh, entertainment as meaningless. So you don't draw the connection even though you're watching TV every night. You're going to movies, you're going to all these theatrics. Meanwhile, the horizontal thinker doesn't understand the importance of the vertical thinker who is doing all of these jobs that you consider meaningless, that you consider drone uh, worker bee jobs. But their existence allows for your existence to have space to flourish and think about things deeper and make associations and connections that you wouldn't be able to do if you were too busy thinking about putting bread on the table. A hundred percent. And you know what? I felt like as I, um, so I'm 30 now, but as I got towards my late twenties, um, I began to look at both uh, the way you describe it, horizontal and vertical thinking. And um, I said, okay, what, what can I do to structure this so I can have elements of both, right? Uh, be able to integrate these two dualistic worlds into my own psyche, into my own daily action and practice. Um, and it's a bit of a background, like traditionally, I have a very creative mind, I would say. Um, from growing up, uh, I loved reading. I loved reading, um, you know, really uh, interesting nonfiction books. Uh, sorry, fiction and non-fiction books um, I read. Um, and 
So I had a knowledge for understanding, you know, about the world geography. Like I learned about, I learned about geography through the world cup, like the FIFA world cup 98. <laughs> like I'm like, okay, these are, these are my, this is how I'm going to learn my facts. Uh, but then I learned, for example, about, uh, maybe different philosophies, different religion through stories or, um, you know, I was reading Harry Potter. Like you learn about that, that creative part of magic and stuff like, um, and also playing video games, you know, I really got into, uh, playing, um, I don't know. Did you grow up with a Nintendo 64? I did. <laughs> okay, good, good. So I, I'm not going to be speaking another language now. So, I mean, I grew up playing Zelda, um, games like that, Banjo Kazooie. So no, yeah, that, those games, they put you in a different realm and they just bring a whole new reality. And then it, it just, all of these, uh, neurotransmitters start firing and letting you know, like, Hey, life can actually be so much. It can actually be beyond what you see. I think coming into this particular conversation, it just made me realize that I would say the Nintendo 64 growing up on that, on a dietary <laughs> a diet a mind diet of nintendo 64 games really changed the way i saw the world because um i think before like you, you generally think more vertical thinking right you know like you're more process driven but i once i once i got um a nintendo 64 and even playstation uh, ps1 I, and i i love playing street fighter by the way so i was really getting into the backstories of some of these fighters you know oh yeah it's from japan learnt this cool martial art you know how did he do these fireballs i started really thinking about the possibilities of what what can this human do what is this human capable of right what is the extent that you can stretch the boundaries of the human um the, the, the human physics and what is the potential of the subjective world in this human experience to be able to do it because the reality is and this is one thing you continuously see in progressive science and i can i can say that for example galileo's um, way of thinking, um, Einstein's way of thinking was always thinking years into the future, even Tesla. He predicted Wi-Fi and the um, advanced ways of communication long before that was even possible, right? But this has to do with incorporating the level of horizontal thinking into, into the vertical narrative, the vertical sphere of how we can continue, continue things day to day. So we need to find a way to integrate that level of creativity to make it practical so that the vertical thinkers can realize and say, hey, these things are going to improve our quality of life. Maybe it not, might not be in the next year, but it might be in 10 years time. Let's just focus on, on putting research and effort into it to seeing what, what the potential can be for the human experience. Right, because it's uh, the human experience isn't meant to be lived any one which way, because if it did, we'd live in a homogenous world, but that's not the reality. We live in such a diverse world. It's there are some cultures and some ways of life that we still have any, we still have not discovered because they're so spread out, remote and hidden. Yeah. I mean, where do you think in the world at the moment? I mean, I remember I asked someone, um, what part of the world have been discovered, right? Uh, what part of the world haven't been discovered? And guy told me, I reckon every corner of the earth has been discovered. I disagreed. Okay. I mean, not that I've done all the research, but I've traveled, right? And the way I see it is even if you discovered something, that place is going to change tomorrow, one year, yeah. two years, three years, 50, five years. You know what I mean? That place is continuously changing. The world is continuously evolving before our very eyes. I don't know if you believe in singularity, but there's a singularity effect where everything is slowly coming together and every, and we have more and more knowledge um, of what is going on as, as the world continuously kind of um evolves uh, we do we have so much more knowledge today than we did ten thousand years ago than we did for those of us who believe in millions of years of human evolution for whatever place in life we were back then like i don't see consciousness being a backwards game it's not it, it, it doesn't make be. any sense it's like once something is assimilated it's there it has become a part of the collective existence or the possibility for it to exist is now a possible vector, whereas it hasn't been a vector of thought that has been discovered yet. A consciousness is, um, I mean, you've, you've read Terence McKenna, right? McKenna? Of course. <laughs> yeah, so McKenna's great. Um, I think McKenna's, a lot of people really took McKenna as a, as a typical loon, but 
once we actually take a look into the depth of his work, and you've got to remember, he did a lot of his writings in the 90s where people still really didn't have an idea of the p potential of psychedelics, which now we see a lot more research in um, how mushroom psilocybin can assist with therapy like, um, you know, cluster headaches and even depression and whatnot, same as MDMA, um, that type of thing, you know, to be able to actually assist the human being in their own well-being rather than just tripping out. But McKenna... Um, McKenna really spoke about this uh, concept of singularity, right? And how that, you know, time wave zero, that eventually, you know, the whole world will come to understand its very nature, right? And how the whole, the whole cog in the system is, oper every cog in the system is operating, as you said. And that that will just continuously expand to, in a way that we, we won't be able to fathom because it'd be so rapid. I think the coronavirus and the fact that people were static at home for a while made people and then all these news narratives were coming out made people realize that hey there is something bigger and deeper going on here now um this is part of one whole big picture and we really got to start finding out what reality is because it's not a one-dimensional narrative that we're mm -hmm. taught by the media or by our family yep it's like there are the there are the physical sensations we experience. It's one dimension. There's what each individual is registering in their experience. It's another dimension. There is the fact that there is color, and this isn't a black and white experience. And everything usually happens within the gray area. So this is like there's so many aspects to living a human life, but you have so many so many mainstream narratives that are saying, "This is what you should do. This is what you should do," and so now that people are being exposed to things that are happening all over the world, there are a lot of people who for the first time in their lives are being traumatized. And their traumatic response is what you're seeing today with the entire division that's happening. Because since they, here's something about people who have been traumatized and you probably know this because you know once you recover from trauma, your ability to handle shit in life, to handle hardship, to see Easy. disgusting things in life, it's much easier for us to handle it. Easy. Like you can watch someone get murdered and understand that you can't do anything in that situation and not have a breakdown over it. But someone else who has never seen that, who has lived a cushy lifestyle, who has been sheltered and protected by mom and dad, who has gone to the best schools, had a perfect life. When they see that, their perception of the world breaks in that moment. Yeah, I, I think the one thing that really opened my eyes, aside from maybe high level of psychs, um, would have been just traveling a lot um, and putting alone, alone, because alone you have no safety. You're just on your own and you need to make the most of um, who you are and what you do when you're there. And I think um, living in Kashmir, which I bring up from time to time, was probably the first, the first reality breaker for me because it was, there was a direct connection between myself and my family and the life there and even part of how my gene has been formed as a result of that oppressed particular um, society. And I didn't really realize that until I went to visit Kashmir and meet other Kashmiri men who are my age and see their um, actual cognitive way of thinking, their behavior. And even though I grew up in Australia, it doesn't matter because... Um, you still carry the, whatever genes you were passed down. Exactly. No, okay, so the brain doesn't... Re like. Because if you think about it this way, it's a very interesting way of looking at it. And so let's just say like, you know, if my, you know your father grew up in another country, right? Well, he, he may have married a, a woman. Um, he may have married a woman from another country too. But in the early years of your cognitive development, you're basically just being sheltered and cared for, right? You haven't socialized yet until maybe you're the age three or four. But in those early fetal stages, early stages of development, the way the baby is being formed is based upon a combination of the genes of the father and mother. And that is predisposed from the environment they grew up in. Right. Yep. It's pretty, because it has to be, because that, because that's what is in assumption prior that's to the basically, birth. That's what's that. When you look at the gene pool, this is what mama brought to the table. And this is what Papa brought to the table. Now you're going to mix them up and have soup. Exactly. Exactly. And this dictates a lot of things, the way your brain structured, how you look, all that type of stuff. Right. Um, and once I went back to Kashmir, I was around Kashmiri men who fathers were from the same place my father was from. And I saw, I saw how it was, it was kind of a bit of a, like, 
what, what do they call it? uncanny valley in a way where you actually see, oh, okay, now I understand why I relate to you guys more than I relate to Aussie people back in Australia or people I grew with back in Australia. That freaked me out. Okay, in a good that's the, way because that, that's the same thing for me. When I go visit, when I go visit Guatemala, there is a kinship there that's just present that I can't really understand. But when I interact with the people there, it just feels like I know everybody there and they understand me because we all share similar uh, ancestral uh, bonds and genetic material because we're all from the same place. Yeah, I can't explain it. I mean, what what's been your experience? I mean, yeah, Guatemala is a country that um, I've never been to. I'd love to go. I, re I remember I really liked the flag, the, the white and blue flag with the golden kind of crescent in the middle. Um, so one of the common perceptions that you will receive from a Guatemala, and there's two main perceptions, like if you ask them about Americans or if you ask them about Europeans in general, because they see Americans the same way that they see Europeans. They're really the same people. Um, they don't really have anger for them, but then there are also a group of people that do have anger for them. But what the biggest perception in my home country is towards them is just sadness. Sadness, because now you take, you look at the Guatemalan people who are a mixture of indigenous and Spaniard people. So on the indigenous side, we have somewhat of a relationship with nature. It's not the most accurate. Many other tribes have their own relationship with nature. Everyone defines it whatever way they want to, but the indigenous people there who are descendants from the Aztecs, from the Mayas, they have their own special relationship with nature that they've noticed that the European people don't have. And that ties in back to the fact that Europe is a different geograph geographical landscape, landscape than yeah. Guatemala is. So mm -hmm. Guatemala is very, very forested. There's a lot of jungles, there's a lot of mountains, and there's a lot of ecosystems. And this is something that a lot of people in uh, Western society don't realize, but when they go out into the mountains, like here in New Jersey, if you go out into the mountains in New Jersey, you're not getting a taste of what fresh and actual raw nature feels like. It, it is just a safe space. It's had all of the majority of its ecosystems removed mm -hmm. so that it's safe enough for a human to just be there and not worry about anything. When but Guatemala is kind of like a bit more wild. It has that edgy of wild. A, right. It's a bit more wild. Like if you want to be outside over there, you want to be in the mountain by yourself. You want to have a shotgun. You want to have a machete. You want to have uh, some hard form of clothing to protect your chest because we still have panthers out there. We still have all types of uh, boars. So it's like you're not going out there in nature and having the it's same. It's not a uh, civilized reserve. It's not it's a right. It's it's not a reservation for citizens. It is actual nature. A jungle. It's a jungle. Right. Jungle out there. So <laughs> this kind of circles back to the validity of information, people's perception of what the world really is. And so now you have a lot of people who believe that we can just crush all of these systems that exist right now and fall back into nature. And in my head, it's like, wait, I grew up in this environment and 90% of you guys would die within the first week. What are you talking about? Like you guys won't survive out in the wild. You don't know what the wild is like because you're so used to living in society. So does it make any sense for you to say, let's burn down our home because we're human, so we automatically expect ourselves to live in the wild, even though you're so disconnected from that. Yeah, I agree. Because, for example, living in Kashmir, it's very much like that too. Don't get me wrong. It's Kashmir kind of built itself up and the Indian, Indian occupation came. Um, it did scare away a lot of the um, wildlife from the, from the main area. But just to give you an example, when my father was growing up there in, in um, the uh, 60s and 70s, there were tigers, leopards, sorry, leopards that were coming into um, the, the, the garden or whatnot near where he was staying, bears, um, a lot of wild animals. And if you just went out a bit out of the residential areas, then you'd enter national parks with all that. Um, and um, even if you go on the roads, a lot of the roads weren't done. You know, there, there was a lot of dangerous animals out, out there. You know, you were living in the middle of um, kind of the wilderness, you know, and that's the way it looks even parts of it now. Of course, you know, the issue that has happened has kind of had an impact on the environment, but it, it, at the end of the day, it was a very similar type of, of um, way of life. You know, I remember when I was there, I wouldn't be able to get uh, milk from uh, the convenience store. I'd have to go to someone who owned a cow, get raw milk, which by the way, is illegal to buy in Australia. You can't really buy it. Um, Same thing here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you had to get raw milk and you had to boil it. And uh, once I boiled it, I, I poured it with my corn flakes. It tasted pretty good. So, or, or frosted flakes, I think they call it, you know, Tony the Tiger? 
Yeah. <laughs> I think that guy's permanently on an acid trip on a cereal box. But yeah, um, it's kind of like the best thing, you know, um, raw milk with, with, with cornflakes. But you would, but you the, getting the raw milk was an obstacle. You had to go to someone who owned a cow. It wasn't as simple as going to the convenience store. Um, and once that also broke my reality a bit, Ignis, because I started thinking, well, this is, if I try to explain this to someone in Australia, they wouldn't get it. You know, they just wouldn't get that. This is how people still live. And even crazier, these people are the people that are most connected to me because of my uh, background. It's similar for me because I still have a deep appreciation for nature. It's not something that I can just say to hell with it or fucker because I am a part of it. This body has to go back into the dirt eventually. So there's that kinship and understanding. And I know that I am not something that exists outside of it. I am a part of it. So I kind of have a responsibility to partake in the circle of life. So when I come to society and I see people acting the way that they do, especially my Caucasian friends, even though I really don't want to dis differentiate between people, but the people who grew up here and just have no experience of life anywhere else, they just, it, it doesn't register to them. And even when you show them the facts and the evidence, the bells of cognitive dissonance begin to ring and then they don't realize it and then they start to try to reason with why what you're saying is wrong and why they should continue to believe in what they believe because let's face it, Changing our belief system requires effort and a lot of humans are just lazy.